Welcome to Aggie Hort Facebook Live. Today we're going to be talking about lawns, late summer lawn care. We're going to talk about some of the common problems that we have in our lawns like pests and diseases, some of the most important practices to have a beautiful lawn, and also we're going to talk a little bit about how to get grass to grow better in the shade. That's quite a challenge for many of us with large beautiful trees. There's going to be folks online answering your gardening questions in the chat. So feel free to ask questions as you go, and there'll be plenty of horticulturists that are able to assist you. Right now, let's go ahead and start with the first most important thing about lawn care, and that's mowing. Now, it may seem strange to talk about mowing being the most important, but it really is important. The more often you mow, the denser the lawn becomes. It's kind of like a hedge. If you only trimmed your hedges once a year, you'd get a lot of growth and then cut them way back and they'd be kind of bare because the new growth would shade out the leaves on the interior. Well, the more often you hedge trim with the lawnmower, your lawn, the denser your lawn becomes. I'll show you. When we mow our lawn, we would like to cut about a third of the long grass off each time we mow. So I set my mower pretty high because the taller your grass is, the deeper the root system can be. We can mow our lawns very, very short, but that lack of height on top results sometimes in less depth in the root system. So in this case, I've got my lawn set to mow at about three inches. And so once it grows up to about four, or a little over four inches, four and a half, five, I can go ahead and cut it off down back to the three inch level. So the goal is to cut off about a third each time you mow. That way there's not too significant of a pruning with the mowing that you do. It's important to have a really sharp lawn blade. If your blade is dull, it tends to tear the ends of the grass blades off. And whenever the grass blades are not cut cleanly, they get a very uh, tan tip on them that multiplied a billion times over, takes a little bit of the nice green color out of the lawn by blending in all those little tan tips. With a good, clean, crisp cut, you don't get so much of a tan tip and your lawn is more attractive. Also, it's easier on the mower. If your mower has a dull blade and it's just basically tearing off the ends of the gra grass blades, you're gonna end up with more wear and tear and it lugs it down more to go through the grass that way. So by keeping your mower sharp and by mowing frequently, you can have a good healthy lawn. The other thing is to return the clippings when you mow. If you've got a really nice mulching mower, it chops these up very fine, but the idea would be to return these clippings to the grass. So think about it this way. This grass blade has the perfect blend of all the nutrients that it takes to grow grass. That's not just nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, the ones that you get on the fertilizer bag, but all the micronutrients, iron and manganese and zinc, sulfur and, and other, uh, other nutrients. And so when you cut that blade off and drop it back into the lawn to decompose and release the nutrients, you're fertilizing your grass. Some of our turf scientists have done studies and determined that your lawnmower puts out more fertilizer than a fertilizer spreader. If you were to take all the clippings through a year of mowing and weigh them and send them to the lab and have them analyzed, you're putting out a lot more nutrients when you mow than when you fertilize. Not in one mowing, but in the course of the season. Once summer gets here, which it's here for sure now, and we get this warm, hot weather, and then you're irrigating your lawn, these clippings decompose very rapidly. They don't contribute significantly to thatch. Thatch is primarily caused by grass blade runners or grass runners and by the roots that are up at the ground surface area because they don't decompose very rapidly. These are mostly simpler carbohydrates and they decompose very quickly. So mulching your lawn does not create a thatch problem. Overwatering and over fertilizing and creating a lot of runner growth that does contribute to a thatch problem. So return those clippings. If you bag your clippings and pay the trash man to haul them away, you're just renting fertilizer. Think of it this way. You're buying nutrients, putting it on the ground, growing grass blades with it, 
cutting those blades off full of nutrients, putting them in a bag and setting them on the curbside. That's called renting fertilizer. So take advantage of the fertilizer you bought and recycle it again and again into your lawn. By the time you hit this time of the season, there's not a, leaf, not a lot of need for additional fertilizer. So by returning your clippings, you're saving yourself on the fertilizer bill, as well as the trouble of having to go and fertilize as well. So the first step in good lawn care is to mow well. The second step is to water well. When we water our lawn, we want to wet that soil deeply. That allows for deep root growth to reach down and get that moisture. And then we want to allow it to dry out so that as the water profile moves down in the soil, air comes in behind it and those deep roots get plenty of oxygen. One of the things that limits root depth is frequent watering that creates a saturated surface and doesn't allow oxygen down into the soil. So by watering deeply and infrequently, you can have a really nice lawn. You would like to put on about an inch of water when you water. Now it takes varying amounts of time to apply an inch depending on what type of sprinkler you have. There's the pop-up solid state sprinklers, the rotors that spray across the yard. If you're a hose dragger, you can, you've got the impact sprinklers and the oscillating sprinklers that uh, water, they actually do a good job of watering. Uh, and then there's the multi-stream rotor. So each of those puts water out at a different rate. You wanna apply one inch and in most lawns, you can't put down one inch without having runoff. So what we do is what's called cycle and soak. You run your sprinklers as long as you can until you start to get, you're about to start to get runoff and then have them go off, set for about 30 minutes to an hour, and then have the sprinklers come back on again. And you water until it's about to run off and then go off and allow it to soak. That cycle and soak, however many times that takes, allows you to wet that soil deeply and then you can turn them off. And I, and even in the sunny areas, I water my lawn about once a week, and that's adequate uh, here in Texas. Now that's in the absence of rainfall. We do get rain in some parts of the state uh, fairly frequently. In other parts, uh, those of you out, uh, say west of 35 especially, uh, that part of the state is gonna need a little more water to keep the lawn going and alive. There's also a lot of difference between how much you water in the sun versus how much you water in the shade. In the shade, the demands are significantly less and you need to water significantly less uh, to keep the grass happy. So when you run your sprinklers, the best time of day to do that is early in the morning. It's cool. The evaporation is at its minimum at that time of the day. You can get that water in the ground. The sun comes out and it dries off the grass. The more you keep the grass wet, the more you invite disease problems into the lawn. And so watering early, you got good water pressure in most cases, and you can really get a good soaking of your lawn. If you water during the heat of the day, you lose more to evaporation, and it's just not, it's just not nearly as efficient uh, for the lawn. Uh, we've talked about mowing, we talked about watering. Now I wanna talk a little bit about fertilizing. Now in most cases, we don't need to fertilize much during the summertime, if any at all. In fact, I, I never fertilize my lawn once I've done the spring fertilization, uh, I will do a fall fertilization sometimes, but I typically don't fertilize during the summer. However, if your lawn is lacking nutrients, and the best way to find that out is with a soil test, it may be beneficial to do some summer fertilization. Or if you've got a new lawn and you're trying to get it to grow and fill in a little bit better. You wanna start with a soil test. A soil test tells you what's in the soil so that you can put the right fertilizer down in the right amount. Now, it's easy to say this is a lawn fertilizer or, and, and this one is maybe for vegetables or for something else, but in reality, the best fertilizer for your lawn depends on what's already in your soil. Most lawns that I've seen in Texas over the years have plenty of phosphorus, that's the middle number. And so we generally go for a low phosphorus number. As your pH goes up, again, heading toward western parts of the state, and as the phosphorus goes up, you have more iron deficiency. Now, iron deficiency shows up as streaks of green and yellow through the leaf. So you, a normal healthy grass leaf is gonna be all green. Uh, leaf, a leaf with some iron deficiency symptoms will have streaks of green and yellow in it, or maybe almost all yellow, uh, and that's a sign of iron deficiency. That kind of symptom can come and go. 
with the amount of water and the temperature and everything, you may see your lawn get a little yellow and then get better on its own. Uh, but the idea is to have the pH as ideally as you can, but also to have those nutrient levels right. Now, if you don't have a soil test, what you most likely need is nitrogen. That keeps the lawn growing healthy and looking nice and green, which is what we want. That's the first number on the bag. In general, we need about three or four times as much nitrogen as we need phosphorus, the second number on the bag. And potassium kind of comes in in between those two. So you'll hear Extension recommend fertilizers like 3-1-2 ratio or 4-1-2 ratio. And so they could be a lot of different fertilizers. 6 2, 4 is an organic 3-1-2 ratio. 15-5-10 is a synthetic 3-1-2 ratio. Whichever you choose, you want to apply about a pound of nitrogen when you fertilize. To, to get that number, take the fertilizer you bought, find the first number on the bag, and divide it into 100. That's how many pounds of that fertilizer you put on a thousand square feet of lawn. So just measure the length times the width, come up, you know, roughly how many thousand square feet. Don't worry about getting an exact. If you even try to measure, you're doing better than 98% of the folks out there that just put the fertilizer on. So try to come close, uh, put that amount down. It takes about a pound of, of nitrogen to get the most boost uh, in the spring. And you can go down to as low as a half pound. I usually fertilize about a half pound because I just, I would rather fertilize more than once if needed and not overdo it. Uh, the most important time to fertilize is that spring fertilization. We do that not by date, but when we've mowed the lawn twice. So think about it, you're coming out of winter, the stores are piling up the fertilizer at the door so you have to climb over them to get into the, into the store. That's not the time to fertilize. When you've mowed your grass two times, it's growing fast enough to need fertilizer and it's got the roots to take it up. Coming out of winter, that grass plant has very little root system to be able to take up nutrients. In fact, it's losing its old root system and growing a new root system. So in most of the state, by about, let's say, April 1st in the, in the southern part of the state, April 15th, middle state, maybe a little bit later uh, as you go northern parts of the state, but around April 15th, that's unfortunately an easy day to remember, right? That's about when we fertilize in most of the state. Uh, but again, don't go by the calendar. Every year is different. Go by the lawnmower. When you mow twice, it's time to fertilize. Oh, and by the way, mowing weeds doesn't count. It's mowing the grass that gauges when we when we need to fertilize. You want to apply that at the right rate and then when you apply it you want to water it in well. So fertilizing season is coming up again in the fall. Uh, the fall is an important one especially if your lawn is struggling because it gives it nutrients to go into winter. Think of it as almost like an antifreeze in the, in the grass system that helps it to be more cold hardy and to come out stronger in the spring. Remember what I said about not having the root system when you're coming out in the spring because that root system is going away and the new roots are coming on, you want a good strong grass plant going into winter so that it comes out strong in the spring as well. So the fall fertilization is usually done about probably six weeks or so before the first frost. Uh, most of the state, again, to give you a rough idea on a, on a calendar date, that would be late September, early to mid-October, somewhere in there, depending on how far north or south you are. Uh, but that gives it a boost. It takes up nutrients and it gets ready to go on dormant, which will come later in the fall, and, uh, or to slow its growth, uh, and it comes out really good and strong in the spring. The other thing I want to talk about are some of the problems we have in the lawn in the summer. One of the problems is grubs. Uh, grubs are little white C-shaped worms that come from those June beetles. Many Texans grew up sticking June beetles in a jar uh, and bringing them inside to watch them at night. Uh, but June beetles lay eggs in the spring that hatch out into grubs, and those grubs go down deep in the soil when it's hot, like right now. Uh, so treating for grubs now is a total waste of money. You're not going to get the product down to them. They're very down, very far down deep into the into the into the soil as the, as the temperatures heat up. Uh, the time to treat for grubs, if you need to, would be way in early summer. Uh, that would be a time to try to get uh, some grub control products down. Uh, but grubs, when they're thick enough in the soil, 
they will sever the grass roots and you can literally pick the grass up like a throw rug because they've just cut all the roots off. Uh, that is really rare in my experience to see that here in Texas. I know it can happen and it does happen, but I can think on one hand the number of times I've seen a grub problem that warranted treatment. It takes about five to seven grubs per square foot to be enough to warrant treatment. So that's a lot of grubs. There's always gonna be grubs out there. If I went in my lawn right now, there would be grubs here. And there are grubs in all lawns. But it takes enough of them to warrant that treatment. And that's five to seven grubs per square foot. That's a lot of grubs. So in most cases, if you're seeing problems on your lawn, it's not grubs, although I have to leave the possibility open that it could be. The thing we see most at this time of the year are chinch bugs. Chinch bugs have a spring generation that's not very bad and you don't really notice them much. And then they have a second generation that occurs in late summer uh, in, up into the early part of fall. But primarily in late July and August is in early September is when we get our chinch bug window. Chinch bugs have piercing sucking mouth parts and they literally suck the juices out of the grass. So you look at your lawn and it looks like it needs watering. It starts to turn brown and you water it and it doesn't improve it. The soil's plenty wet, the lawn's not responding. That's one of the signs of chinch bugs. So you wanna make sure with, with uh, chinch bugs that you park the lawn and look for the little insects. You can Google what they look like, but basically they're black, the adults are black and white, little tiny one eighth of an inch long bugs. The, the nymphs don't have wings and they're more of a reddish with a, a white band across their back. Uh, but if you have a significant chinch bug problem, you wanna treat that area where the problem is visibly occurring as well as a little bit into the lawn because chinch bugs have already moved out into that area. So uh, if, you're, if you're checking for chinch bugs, look at that zone between healthy and dead. That's where you're gonna find the most chinch bug populations and that's, that's where you would do your assessment to know that's your problem. The other thing I wanna talk about a little bit uh, with uh, the summer lawn problems is take all root rot. Take all root rot uh, is a fungal disease that kills the roots and the runners of the grass plant. And so you see an erratic dying out. It's not the big brown circles that we see in the fall and spring from, from large patch, also previously known as brown patch, uh, but it's a, it's a general dying out of the lawn. Uh, you, the best way to determine if you have take all is to take a sample, and we have a video where you can go watch how to do that, but you wanna go to the zone between healthy and dead because if it's dead, they can't do autopsies at the lab. And if it's healthy, there's nothing to find. The zone between healthy and dead, the sick grass, take about a four by four inch plug or a four by six inch plug, put it right into a Ziploc and zip it up. That way, if there's chinch bugs there, they'll find them. And if the disease is there, they'll find it. You want to get a little bit of roots, a little bit of soil, maybe a couple inches of soil with some, some extra roots and put it in the bag. And you can send it to the, to the state plant clinic at A&M and they can diagnose what the problem is on that grass. And if you have take all, they'll tell you the options that you have for treating it. While take all doesn't primarily attack in the summer, uh, as it's taking the root system away and the temperatures are going up and the demands are going up on the grass, we start to see grass dying out. And so a lot of the summer problems are the result of fall and spring infections with the take all uh, root rot fungus. So the last thing that we want to talk about today is dealing with the shade. Trees and grass don't like each other. Trees would like to be in a forest where their whole root system is covered with rotting leaves. That's tree heaven. Having grass around it is not. Grass wants to be in a meadow where it gets full sunlight and doesn't have to deal with these trees. We try to make them go together in our yards and it's a little bit of a challenge to do that. When we get less and less light, our grass quality goes down, as many of you know. And so St. Augustine grass is the best grass for shady spots here in Texas. Uh, it's, if, if you can't grow St. Augustine there, it's probably too shady for anything. When shade gets dense, what happens is you start to get less and less density to your grass. So as the grass density declines, you start to see dirt, you start to get weeds in, and just coming back in here to look at this area, uh, you can see there's really thin grass in this particular area. And it's because of the combination of a couple of big shade trees and a privacy fence that's preventing light from reaching the ground. 
Uh, whenever sunlight does hit the soil or when you get light at the soil, you're going to start to get weed seeds. And so thinning grass, whether it's from insects or diseases or, or uh, shade problems, is going to result in more weed problems in that part of the lawn. So what we want to do is make a decision. If it's too shady for St. Augustine, this would be a good spot for a ground cover or shade loving shrubs or something else that will thrive and do well in this amount of light. If it's very marginal and the, the grass may do okay, and there are many lawns that have a lot of trees, but the light is, is very bright. It's a dappled shade, but it's, there's a lot of foot candles. It, there's, a, there's a lot of brightness to the light and you can keep grass growing. Now, if you start putting a lot of foot traffic on it or you start drought stressing it or other things, you may find it going downhill. And I've noticed that once grass starts downhill in the shade, it's kind of hard to turn it around and bring it back. Sometimes removing a tree or removing anything else you can to get more light in, more incidental light, can help a little bit. But although some people recommend going in and thinning the branches out of a tree, that's not a real good arboricultural practice and it generally does very little good for the grass. And in fact, within a few years, the tree's just back where it was and you're right back where you were. So think about your grass. The other thing I would recommend doing in the shade is setting that mower higher. These grass blades are like solar panels. And so think about that as a solar panel. If it's a very bright light, it can make a lot of carbohydrates with a lot of that solar energy. If it's a very dim light and you have a little more solar panel to capture it, you might stand a better chance of maintaining a somewhat healthy grass plant. And that's what we're trying to do. So if you mow really short in the shade, you're gonna send the grass the other way and it's gonna start to thin out even more. It's not, a, it's not just by mowing high you, you make grass grow in any shade, it just gives it a little more help. And then keep it moist enough, but uh, don't try to replace sunlight with fertilizer or water. You can't do that. So if grass is struggling in the shade and the soil is moist and the fertilizer, the fertility is moderate, that's as good as you're going to do. Pushing it with more water and fertilizer, again, just sends it the other way and is not really going to help. So what we've been talking about today are a lot of the principles of lawn care. The three main things we deal with on lawn care are mowing and watering and fertilizing. If you do those three right, you are well on your way. And we'll save weed control for some other day. Uh, that's another topic people like to talk about. Uh, but when it comes to insects and disease, quick diagnosis, early diagnosis, so you can take prompt action is the best thing that you can do. And just one word about weed control, when it is hot, some of those weed control products are extremely stressful to your turf and can in fact even kill it. And so avoid the weed control products during the heat of summer. There's a few that can take it when it's a little warmer, but most of them say once it gets into the mid 80s, stop. Well, mid 80s in Texas is most of the year. So uh, just avoid those weed control products in the summer at all costs. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I want to give a shout out to all the county horticulturists and specialists and others that, from Aggie Horticulture that are helping answer questions today. And we look forward to having you visit us on another Wednesday or Friday when we're doing our Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live.